ask you to turn with me to Psalm 51. Focus of the message today is uh, verse 10, but in order to get the context of verse 10, I'd like to read the entire psalm. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. I draw your attention to the heading of this song. It is in the Hebrew text. Not an addition. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. The great Puritan Matthew Henry says the title has reference to a very sad story that of David's fall. But though he fell, he was not utterly cast down, for God graciously upheld him and raised him up. We find the record of this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, where we read how God sent the prophet Nathan to David to awaken him to his sin. He had uh, gone without repentance for his sins of lust, adultery, and murder for approximately one year. And now comes Nathan to him to awaken him to his sin. And Psalm 51 is a result of that awakening. It is one of seven penitential psalms. The others are 32, excuse me, 6, 32, 38, 102, 130, and 143. So we have here in Psalm 51 wonderful lessons for us on true repentance, what true repentance is, and how true repentance leads to restoration with God. This has often been called the sinner's guide, and certainly it is that. 
One person has given this general outline. Everyone has two needs. Reconciliation, which is one through nine, and has a need for transformation, which is 10 through 19. I would like to offer this summary, still kind of general, leading us to verse 10. In verses one through two, we read there David's cry for forgiveness. He pleads only the mercy of God. He doesn't plead anything in him. He doesn't plead any merit that he might have. He pleads only the, mer only the mercy of God. He doesn't promise that he will reform himself. He pleads the mercy of God. In verses 3 through 6, he confesses his sin. A wonderful lesson for us there. He owns it as his own sin. He refers to, I, I did this. Me, my, my transgressions, my sin. All of these things, he recognizes, were produced out of a wicked heart. Verse 4, we see there the nature of this sin. It is against God. Verse 5, I mean, yeah, verse 5, we see the source of the sin. It is the fall. He is a child of Adam. Then we come to verses 7 through 9 where David appeals for cleansing by God's appointed means. He prays that God would blot out his sin. <coughs> Remove my sin from your record book. Remove that indictment against me. Blot out my sins. And then in verses 10 through 12, David prays that God would work in his heart. Well, why? Because he knows, and this is something that you and I ought to know, everyone ought to know, that as the heart goes, so goes the life. David prays for this inward renewal, that he would know true restoration before God, and that God would preserve him from sin. Then in verses 13 through 17, we see David's desire to tell others what he has learned of God's mercy toward him, what God has done for him. And in this wonderful Verse, it says so very, very much. Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. And then in verses 18 and 19, David's prayer for Zion, for God's people. Which brings us to our focus, verse 10. So after David prays for forgiveness, pleads the mercy of God. Prays that his sins would be blotted out. Now he prays for sanctification. After he prays that God would forgive him of his sin, he prays that God would restore him back into fellowship with him and cleanse him from his sin. So as we look at verse 10, what is the meaning of these words? When David prays this, what is he doing? David is saying, oh God, as in the beginning, when you brought the world and heaven out of nothing, by your sovereign creative power. So now create something in me. You see the word create shuts us up to the sovereign omnipotence of almighty God. Interestingly, this is the same word used three times in Genesis 1 for the creation narrative. So what is David doing? What is he praying David is asking for nothing less than a miracle in his life, in his heart, in his soul. It must be a creation out of nothing. Why? Because if any of it came from David himself, that little bit would poison everything. And so David prays to God that God would create in him a clean heart. Now, of course, you know, this he's not talking about the heart organ, but of the seat of the affections, of his affections, of his will, of his desires. Proverbs 4.23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. 
I mean, in the words of Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Some versions have, I think the ESV says, desperately sick. And who can understand it? Reed says, when we are spiritually taught of God to know something of the, de the desperate wickedness and deceitfulness of our hearts, we are prepared to feel the force of the exhortation. He's talking about Jeremiah 17 and Proverbs 4.23. Watch over your heart. We find really the same thing in verse 6, Psalm 51. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. You see, when you and I dig down into our own lives, when we get beneath all of our actions, all of our words, we finally get to the seat, to the root out of which all of this flows. It is as Jesus said, out of the heart flows the issues of life. And that's what David means when he prays to God that he would create in him a pure, a clean heart. Oh God, do something in me. Get at the bedrock of my life where I can't get to. I can't get to it. I can't change it. And then David parallels that with the last part of verse 10. And we knew a right spirit within me. The King James, the ESV, says a right spirit. New American Standard translates it as a steadfast spirit. It has the idea of to renew something. The idea is to bring it back to what it originally was. And so David is praying that God would renew within him a right, a steadfast spirit. Literally, it means to be made ready, to be made stable. David is confessing, Lord, I sin because my spirit was fickled. I sin because my heart was not fixed upon you. My heart was not fixed upon holiness. My heart was not fixed upon purity. My spirit went after my lusts. When I was tempted, when temptation came to me. I did not respond as Joseph did. You know the story? How when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he turned from it and said, How can I sin against God? So here day is David acknowledging before God that his spirit was not steadfast. This same accusation is brought against the Israelites in Psalm 78, verse 37. We're told that the root of their problem in there in the wilderness was, as it says, there, in God's word, their heart was not steadfast toward God. When they were faced with difficulties, what did they say? Oh God, if only we had died in Egypt. You see, their spirit was not steadfast toward God. They did not believe his promise to give him that, the, the, the land, the promise. They did not trust him. Their hearts were not steadfast toward him. And that's what David says about himself. Never forget a good friend of mine many, many years ago said the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Do you realize that? So with David and it is so with you, with me, with all of us. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The root of my problem is this, David is saying. My heart is polluted and it needs cleansing. And my spirit is not steadfast. It is as unstable as water. O oh Lord, put steel in my spirit and make it steadfast. The great Charles Spurgeon said, None but God can create either a new heart or a new earth. The heart is the rudder of the soul. Until the Lord take it in hand, we steer in a false and foul way. 
That's what we want. We want God to take in His hand our hearts. Our hearts. Create, O oh God, what is not there. Heart purity. Renew what is there but languishing. A steadfast spirit within me. Now what are some of the lessons we learn from this? What use is this to us? And there are lessons, many lessons here for believers, but lessons here also for unbelievers. Lessons for those who know Christ, joined to Christ by faith, and those who do not know Christ and not trusting in Him. First of all, there is a lesson on the biblical balance of David's prayer. We learn how thorough his prayer is. We learn how biblical his prayer is. Notice again verse 9. He says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. God cannot, the Bible says, cannot look upon iniquity. It is as Matthew Henry put it. David prays for a complete and effectual pardon. Hide your face. By your grace, cast them behind your back. By your mercy, forget them. By your mercy, blot them out. Hide your face from my sin. Now why does he pray this way? What is he getting at? It is this. David recognizes that all sin, not blotted out, not done away with, by God's grace, by God's mercy, the Lord Jesus Christ is a loud voice crying out to God for judgment. And so David is thinking of sin as this, in, in, a, in a legal sense. I don't know if you've ever heard of N.T. Wright, very controversial, or an Episcopal priest. A lot of people are falling for this. His writing is very popular. He says, yeah, we have forgiveness in Christ, through the shed blood of Christ, but there's no, nothing legal involved in it. We say, no, there is. Absolutely. We are forgiven of our sins. And through Christ, trusting in Christ, in His sacrifice, his, and in his, his righteousness, His fulfillment of the law, His active, we call, we call this active obedience, we are declared legally just before God. Having fulfilled all the law through the Lord Jesus Christ through faith in Him. Here's David crying out, blot out my transgressions. Remove that indictment against me from your book, from your record book, for the sake of your mercy, your mercy alone. In other words, David's prayer is biblically balanced, sort of uh, covers all the bases. And ours must, ought to be the same. David did not stop short of praying for those two basic needs that sin always creates in the life of a believer and, of course, in the life of a non-believer. And that is the need for the, the forgiveness of our sins, the need for the righteousness of Christ, his righteousness being imputed to us and for our moral cleansing, the purifying of our hearts. And God has undertaken to meet these two things in the work, the active obedience of Christ and in His death. These two things. Hebrews, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, really a, a good commentary. On this, Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> written to explain how the death of the Lord Jesus Christ brings into being all of God's promises, beginning at verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until 
His enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. In other words, there are these two great blessings of the new covenant. God said, I will write my word upon your heart and I will do something in the record of your sins and I will remember them no more. I will write my law upon your heart. I will give you from your heart a love for me and a love for my word. And I will erase from the record book your sins. So when the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood, he did so for these two things, for these two blessings. When as a sinner you were brought by the Holy Spirit, by God's grace to see through, through regeneration, as what we call the effectual call of God, Holy Spirit, changing you, transforming you, making you a new creature, as our confession says, enabling you to come to Christ, to trust in Christ. When, by gracious work of the Holy Spirit, you were brought to see your need of Christ, and literally enabled to repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, these two blessings became yours. Your sins were blotted out, out of the record book. God's law written upon your heart so that you were willing to obey Him. You had a desire to love, but to obey Him, and a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is not only true at the beginning of the Christian life. But throughout the Christian life, throughout your walk as a Christian, we have this continual need for these, these two things, a need of forgiveness and a need for cleansing. Because sin not only exposes you and me and every believer to the chastening, disciplining rod of God, but it also defiles us. So we have 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, is faithful and just to do what? Two things. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My sin brings to me both needs. Forgiveness and cleansing. And so we see how biblically balanced David's prayer really is. Though that God would be pleased to so inscribe upon our hearts the great blessings of justification and sanctification, forgiveness and cleansing, are always inseparable in the working of God by the Holy Spirit in the souls and hearts of sinners. So I plead with anyone who here today who doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior, Lord, that you would Recognize, realize that you cannot stand before God by any merit in you. There is nothing that we do that is not tainted by sin. And God's word tells us you must be perfect, even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That perfection comes only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Justified in God's sight through faith in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and your sins forgiven for the sake of the shed blood of Christ. It is not until your sins are blotted out for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will ever begin this process, what we call it, process of sanctification. The same is true of the child of God. The same thing is true of the child of God. We have this great these, these two needs, the forgiveness of our sins and cleansing. But there are many who talk 
Much of justification. A lot about being accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have confessed my sins. But have little desire for moral purification. Their only concern is, I'm in. The indictment against me is blotted out. Whether or not the affections, the will of my heart has been changed. But the true child of God, who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, transformed, has new affections, new desires. He's not content to think only of the legal acceptance, but longs for personal experience of the presence of God in his life as David wanted it. And lost and wanted it. Another lesson here we have is a lesson on the nature, the essence of the Christian life. What is it? What is the essence of the Christian life? It is internal. It is inward. Look with me again, for instance, at verse 6, Psalm 51. Behold, you delight in truth and inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. And now, verse 10. Look how many times, possibly six times, he talks about the heart, the inward, contrived heart, inmost beings, on and on and on, broken spirit. Verse 17. Six times he refers to these things in his prayer. What does that tell us? What does he mean by that? He, they, they, these things tell us that there is an essential inwardness of the Christian life. The essence of the Christian life is inward. Now that is not meant to make you sinfully, uh, morbidly inward looking all the time, but it ought to make you biblically occupied with the state of your heart. The condition of your heart. Why? Because you realize that as your heart goes, so goes your life. Your heart is the seat of your affection, the seat of your desire, the seat of your will. Again, Proverbs 4. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You see, Satan wants you and me to focus upon the external. And to think because you've done this, clean this up, you don't do this or you do that, that you're, you're, you're all right. That it's all settled. That's a satanic lie. John Owen, the great Puritan John Owen, speaks of... Jeremiah 17, heart is desperately wicked, so on it says. He says, the heart is an enemy whose secret strength we cannot discover. Have you found that true? It's so much easier to deal with the outward, focus on the outward, than the heart. But that's where it is. That's where the battle is. And David is careful to trace all that he's done back to his heart condition. Because that's where his affections were. That's where his desires were. <clears throat> David elsewhere says, I will walk in my house in the integrity of my heart. With my whole heart have I sought you. Lord, let me not wander from your commandments. I will praise you with my whole heart. You see, Again and again, David is occupied with the condition of his heart. Because, and this is so important, David had come to realize that he had failed to guard his heart long before he took that walk upon the rooftop and looked down in lust upon Bathsheba. And then all that followed. David had come to realize by God's grace that all that lust, adultery, and then murder would not have been had he steadfastly guarded his heart, his affections, his desires. John Flavel says the greatest difficulty with conversion is to win the heart to God. What he's saying is it takes a miracle of God's grace to do that. And the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. You found that true? 
why it is true in me to keep the heart with God. Do you realize that in your own life? I mean that your real friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, your real spiritual battle is not, first of all, with the outward, with your actions, though that those things are important, but it is with your heart, the seat, the source, the fountain, the root of all that you and I are, of all that we do, all that drives us. Jesus says in Matthew 12, the mouth speaks out of what fills the heart. And we read it earlier, I read it earlier, out of Matthew 15, where Jesus says what, it's what comes out of the heart, that the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks of what is in the heart. And then he went on to say, out of the heart come all kinds of evil. He lists them. We must fight against the flesh, the remains of the old man in us. We must guard the heart, the treasures of the heart, the idols of the heart, the desires of the heart. And so David prays, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Child of God, guard your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. Learn to guard your heart by God's grace. Pray that God would help you. Guard your heart. Fear a cold heart as you would fall into open immorality. Fear a cold heart to Christ. Fear a cold heart to the things of Christ. Even, even as you would open denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the first step to open denial to disobedience to God is a cold heart. Failure to guard your heart. And another lesson. The need for divine intervention for this restoration. Create in me, O God, a clean heart. Only God can create. Man cannot. David acknowledges he had forfeited these things. What things? Fellowship with God, the joy of his salvation, open lips to praise God. That he had forfeited these things, but that he couldn't get them back. He couldn't get them back himself. There's no way that he could get them back. David is helpless before God. So Job asks, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? <laughs> who can? No mere man. God can. Do you want that? You see, only one person smitten with his sins can understand this, can grasp this. But if you are a stranger to godly grief over your sin against God, you have a hard heart toward all this, it's maybe nonsense to you, you will not understand this. But if you are aware that you have sinned against God in your heart when you were no longer spiritually steadfast, then you know what it's like to cry out, Oh Lord, create in me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Create in me a steadfast spirit. Oh God, you must do what I cannot do. Left to myself, I am sick, I am weak. I am unstable. Do you realize this? Do you know this in your own heart, in your own life? It's, it's absolutely spiritually vital for you to know this. For your comfort as a Christian. For your usefulness as a Christian. In the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's true that never, ever on this side of heaven will our hearts be pure. Your heart will not be pure. My heart will not be pure on this side of heaven. Yet, the acknowledgement of this does not hinder the true child of God in making this his goal. To be pure in heart. Let me ask you, do you love your wife? Do you love your husband? Do you love your children? Do you love them perfectly? Never in this life. But you do love them, don't you? And you strive to love them more and more, right? 
That's the way it is with Christ. We'll never love the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly in this life. Our hearts will never be absolutely pure, but you love Christ. You desire Christ. You know you don't love him as you ought, but you want to love him more. You want your affections and desires fixed more and more upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Thomas Reed, Puritan, wrote in 1837, sort of a summary of Psalm 51. Fill me, O Lord, with holy joy, with humble filial fear, my undivided heart and poi in praise to thee in prayer. Protect me from the power of ill, defend my soul from sin, subdue my proud, rebellious will, Make me pure within. Create an ardent, active love. Thy goodness to proclaim. Oh, may I sweetly feel and prove the power of Jesus' name. May Jesus, my beloved, be my shepherd and my friend. Unite my soul, O Lord, to thee in bonds that ne'er shall end. Then shall my raptured soul repeat the wonders of thy grace. Until prostrate at thy mercy seat, I view thee face to face.